Come into God's presence if your hearts are full of hope. Come into God's presence if your hearts full of tears. Come into God's presence and be filled to overflowing with God's love. Let's pray. Living God, when your majesty is beyond words, receive our awe. When your glory is beyond our imagining, receive our wonder. When your power makes us afraid, bless us with understanding. When your acceptance is beyond believing, bless us with faith. And at all times, through the highs and through the lows of life, speak to us and hear us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a faithful God who knows and always keeps his promises. We thank you for the gift of your Son, Christ Jesus. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the gift of eternal life. We praise you for your goodness. We praise you for your kindness. We praise you for your faithfulness. We praise you because we can. We come to you, O God of beginnings. Draw near to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, as we draw near to you through your Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, my name's Aaron. I'm the minister at Benora Point Uniting Church. Welcome to our family. I'd like to just begin by saying Happy Father's Day to all the fathers and grandfathers, all the father figures in people's lives. Thank you for being there when we were young, being there as we grow up, helping us through our challenges. Thank you for being our dads. I thank God for my dad because he teaches me about God and he plays with me. I thank God for my dad because he's always there when I need him with practical wisdom and advice. Uh, he's also willing to have a laugh at my expense. I thank God for my dad because um, he plays soccer with me. I'd like to thank God for, for my dad. He's probably my best mate. Uh, some of my favourite memories are fishing or, or just hanging out with him watching football. So, if you're watching Dad, Happy Father's Day. I love you, mate. Happy, happy Father's, Father's Day, Day Dad! Dad. If we claim we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves. But if we confess our sins to our loving God, He is merciful, He is just, and He will forgive us. So let's pray um, and confess our sins to our Heavenly Father, um, the things that are keeping us from His love and the things that are keeping us from the love of others. Let's pray. Living God, we are sorry for the times that we have pretended that we don't belong to you. We are sorry for the times when we've not stood up or stood out for the things that we should have. We are sorry when we have remained in the dark and been too afraid to shine your light that shines through us. We are sorry when we have left injustices around us because we've been too afraid to speak out or take action. Loving God, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, but you have loved us more than the right we, that we have to expect. Forgive us once more and refresh us and renew us with your Holy Spirit. Forgive us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the good news of the Gospel. And it's for everybody. When God came to earth as Jesus Christ, he came not to condemn the world, 
but to love it, to reconcile our relationship back to him. So hear Christ's words of grace to everyone. Your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Our Bible reading this morning comes from the Gospel according, according to St. Mark, chapter 7, verses 24 to 37. From there he set out and went to the region of Tyre. He entered the house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he couldn't escape notice. But a woman, whose little daughter had an unclean spirit, immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast out the demon from her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by the way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of a Decapolis. They brought him a deaf man who had been had an impediment in his speech and they begged him to lay hand, uh, his hand on him. He took him inside into private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers in his ears, and spat, and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed to him, uh, sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. Then immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered him ordered them to tell no one but the more he ordered them the more zealously they proclaimed it they were astounded beyond measure saying he has done everything well he even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak in this is the word of the lord thanks be to god let's pray amazing god May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and redeemer. May there be more of you and less of me in the words I'm about to deliver. Amen. In our reading, Jesus challenges cultural behaviours and boundaries. Our reading begins as Jesus set out and went into the region of Tyre crossing the boundary into a territory west, uh, west and north of Galilee. He went into the ter territory of Tyre, a region whose residents included both Jews and Gentiles, the, the non-Jewish people. He went there, perhaps he wanted to reach out to the Gentiles to spread the message beyond the Jewish uh, people. He entered a house and didn't want anyone to know he was there. Now we can only guess why he didn't want anyone to know that he was about. Maybe he wanted a, a bit of peace because his cousin John had just been murdered. Maybe it was because um, just before moving on to Tyre he had faced criticism from the Pharisees and Sadducees about how his disciples were eating with unclean hands. Maybe it's because He's been in a whirlwind of uh, a feeding tour and feeding the hungry and, and curing the, the lame and sick, teaching huge crowds. Jesus was bereaved, fatigued and besieged. There's no wonder he wanted to get away from it and, and not, know anyone, not let anyone know he was there. But somebody noticed Jesus. Someone noticed he was in the house and it was a Gentile. The, the text says, Yet he could not escape notice, and she came and bowed down on his feet, and begged him to cast a demon out of her daughter. What if this Gentile woman didn't have enough faith that Jesus could help her or help her daughter? 
Well, if she didn't have enough faith to even approach him. But she did. A Gentile woman had enough faith to go to Jesus, bow down at his feet, and beg him to help. Now, what does it mean that this non-Jewish woman had faith in, in Jesus? Now, I wonder where her faith come from. But I, I guess, really, that doesn't really matter. All you need is a little bit of faith. And we all know that faith is a gift from God, available to everyone. That's what Jesus, or this passage, is teaching us. That we don't have to earn faith. Now, John Wesley, the founder of a Methodist movement, in one of his sermons he said, Faith is not a mere assent to the truth of the Bible, of the articles of our creeds, or of all that is contained in the New and Old Testaments, but it, but it is, over and above this, a sure trust in the mercy of God through Christ Jesus. It is a confidence in the pardoning of God. She had a crumb of faith, and that was enough to make her persist when it seemed like Jesus was being rude to her and disrespectful to her even. It does seem that way, doesn't it? It seems like Jesus was being quite rude and disrespectful. But he really wasn't. Jesus wasn't being rude. He was really treating her as an equal. And this is how rabbis discuss theology with each other. And we have to remember that in their culture, Jesus and this woman were nowhere even close to equals. First, she was a woman. She was second, she was a Gentile woman. And third, she had a daughter that she was claiming to be possessed by an evil spirit. In Jesus' day, her daughter and her, her daughter's debilitating illness or seizures, which the text calls demon possession, would have been viewed by some as punishment for sin. Jesus is a Jewish man, a rabbi, and he shouldn't have been even talking to this woman. Now, having said that Jesus wasn't disrespectful to her or rude, he did call her a dog. Now, Jews commonly use this term to refer to Gentiles as unclean. In her desperation, uh, and with boldness and wit, she comes back at him with a retort that revealed she wasn't a dog, that she was more like a lioness. Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs, she retorted. As I said, I don't think Jesus was disrespecting her. He was testing her faith. He was using a rabbinic method of matching wits to teach her and everybody else around them who were listening that his message was not just for the Jewish people, but for the Gentiles as well. Now, so strong was her desire for her daughter's healing that she dared to match wits with this rabbi, this important man. Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your child. Now Jesus is pleased not only that she matched wits with him and confronted him and, and had a theological discussion with him, but she showed such bold faith in approaching him in the first place and confronting this important man. Now, can you imagine her trip home? Now, put yourself in her shoes. If, if I was her, I would have been going step by step, praying something like, I believe, God, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief, God. She didn't know what scene would greet her when she finally got home. I imagine uh, her being most afraid, almost too afraid to open the front door when she got there. Would a dead... Would her daughter be cured, like Jesus said? Has she placed her faith in the Son of God or in a con man? She steps slowly into the bedroom and pulls the curtains aside. There's no sounds of thrashing and, and limbs wailing or, or screaming. She steps in and stands next to her daughter's bed. There she lies, her little eyes closed, her little face finally at peace, and her body at rest. 
Now maybe the little girl opened her eyes and smiled at him, at her, at her sorry, as she sits down next to her daughter. She finally sees that the demon is gone. Jesus crossed a boundary and, and brought that woman into the kingdom. A woman whose story would have spread around the lands. Now in the second half of our story, it says Jesus returned from a region of Tyre and went out went by the way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee. Returning from a, a Gentile inhabited region, he's going back into a Jewish um, Jewish region. Now as he gets there he's brought a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech. They begged him to lay hands on him. Now in this part of our reading, Jesus is asked to do another healing. This time we have a Jewish man. What boundaries is Jesus crossing here, I wonder? Well, yes, the man is Jewish, but he's still an outcast of society. He can't hear or speak. And once again, people would be asking the question, who sinned? Him or his parents? What made God punish him this way? And yes, up until Jesus came, this is how Jewish people saw God. If things were going well, God had blessed you. But if things were not going so good, maybe a crop failed, or an illness struck, or the whole Jewish nation was packed up and taken into exile, you were being punished for something you or your parents had done against God. But Jesus came to show the true nature of God, a loving, gracious and merciful God. So Jesus is crossing a boundary here, even though he's talking to a Jewish man. Then he touches this unclean man, this man that is on the outside of society. Because of his disability, he would have been labelled as unclean and shouldn't be talked to, let alone touched by a rabbi. Now, there are several ways that this healing is, for, is different to the first one in our reading. Here he takes a man into a private place, away from the crowds. Whereas in the reading with the, the uh, Syrophoenician woman, he talked to her in a crowded place, in a house. He touches the man. He put his fingers into his ears, and spat and touched his tongue. After looking um, to heaven, he spoke, be open, in order to heal a man. Whereas with the Syrophoenician woman, he healed that daughter from um, who knows how far away. No touching was needed. And then another curious thing happens. Jesus tells them, his friends, the deaf man's friends, and the deaf man, not to tell anyone. Now, unlike Jesus' healings in non-Jewish areas, when he healed in Jewish towns, he wanted them to remain quiet and hidden. But... He, wanted, he didn't mind the Gentiles speaking to each other about it. Why? Why is this the case? I, I think it's because Jesus knew his crucifixion was coming, but the time wasn't quite right for it, and he didn't want to hasten the end of his earthly ministry. Here we have two stories of people who do not fit into society. The Syrophoenician woman was, well, a woman to start with, in a society that that was quite enough to make her a nobody but even worse she wasn't Jewish so Jesus shouldn't have really been speaking to her then we have a deaf man with speech impediment I wonder how much teasing was in his childhood other kids laughing at him when he he couldn't hear them or the way he spoke was a bit funny Interestingly, Jesus dealt with those two situations very differently. The woman did not fit into nice company, so Jesus redefined what nice company is. God only loves Jewish people, right? That's what Jesus was saying when he talked to her about food being for the children, not for dogs. The woman, however, understood more about God than people around her would have thought, and she gave a penetrating penetrating and amusingly sassy reply to Jesus. She knew that God had enough love for everyone, for the rest of the world. I love how bold she is. 
This reminds me of, of other cases where Jesus healed from afar, like, like the centurion, another non-Jewish person. His servant was healed by Jesus, by the centurion's faith in Jesus. Now this is pretty amazing because these are people that aren't taught about God from birth. They only hear about Jesus and they believe. And they know truly God's kingdom is and always has been for all people, the whole of creation. Now Jesus had a different plan for the deaf man. He also didn't fit into society. Another peg who wouldn't fit into the right shaped hole. But this time Jesus didn't change the hole. He changed the peg. Jesus didn't fix the cruel people who might have taunted this man and broke his heart. But he went to the heart of the matter and fixed the cause of that taunting. Two different people, two different problems, two different solutions. But with Jesus, both are brought from the outside inside. For the woman who was who was thought to be on the outside of the kingdom, Jesus extended the blanket of God's love to her and showed that the kingdom is for all people, not just a group of nice people. For the man, Jesus saw that his deepest need was to be accepted by his, his peers, the people around him, and have his heart mended. How can we cross boundaries and bring those people outside to the inside. Sometimes people say that the kingdom of God turns the world inside out, but I think it more turns the, the world outside in, bringing people in to God's love. How can we extend God's love and bring people in? Let's pray. Loving God, Thank you for your son. Thank you for coming to earth and living with us and showing us the way. Give us the courage and the wisdom to bring people in. To help them when society has decided they're not worth being helped. Overflow us with your love so that it flows out to everyone and brings them in. Pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We've come to a point now where we might offer prayers for the people and, and the rest of the world. Let's pray. Loving God, we pray for your church around the world. Be with the leaders, give them the strength and courage and wisdom to proclaim the gospel, the good news, in your name. Help them and the members of their congregation reach out and help the poor, the sick, the lonely, the homeless, the ones on the outside of society and bring them into your love. This is especially important in this time during the pandemic. Lord, we pray for the nations of the world we know that you have given us enough resources for the whole world. We know that developed countries could end hunger and poverty in our own countries and in the developing world. Lord, give our government the wisdom to share our resources with those in need, both here in Australia and around the world. May all the nations of the world work together for the common good of all your creation, forgetting about human-made cultural boundaries. Lord, send your spirit and soften the hearts of the leaders of the nation. Give them wisdom. Lord, we pray for our nation, the great wide land of Australia. Help our leaders, both national, state and, and local, stop their bickering and help them realise that we're all in this together and what benefits one should benefit all. We pray for those who have been infected with the coronavirus, Lord. Bring them comfort and healing. We pray for those families who have lost loved ones in this time. Bring them peace, Lord. We pray for the healthcare workers who are risking their own health 
to help others. Lord, keep them safe. We know that it is frustrating to be in lockdown, but we also know that it is temporary. Lord, give us patience. We pray for our community here at Benora Point United Church. Bring your peace to those caring for, for loved ones as, and the, give them the support that they needed during these tough times. Bring the people to our attention that we might need to reach out to. Prepare us for the time when we are being renewed here, following your spirit in a new direction. Give us the eyes to see what the society needs around us and the wisdom and flexibility to adapt to those changing times. Loving God, we pray all these prayers, the ones I've said out loud and the ones on our hearts, in the name of our loving Saviour who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from a time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Once again, I'd like to say Happy Father's Day to all the fathers and the father figures in our lives. <clears throat> Go into your week with the peace and grace that passes all understanding. May it be with you now and forever. Amen. Have a great week, everybody.